Before explaining what forest therapy is, we need to explain what forest bathing. So forest bathing was a practice uh, that originated in Japan in the 1980s. Uh, the original expression is shirin yoku in Japanese, which literally translates to forest bathing in English. And by this, the Japanese really mean the nature of you immersing yourself in the forest atmosphere. We have to thank the Japanese researchers for really studying all the different invisible substances and chemicals in the air of the forest that we know today that are so healing for so many things. So they used this expression originally. So the, the practice of forest bathing really consists in these very slow walks where we go mostly in silence and it takes mostly sensory experience to the forest and nature. How can we really experience and connect to the forest in, the, in this more sensory approach instead of just knowing facts or rationalizing it in traditional naturalistic walks. And it is in its essence what we call a salutogenic practice uh, and what this means, salutogenic, is really that it's a practice that really works on our innate capacity for healing in the body and in the mind. So forest therapy, uh, it's basically forest bathing applied for a specific population to really enhance or support treatment or rehabilitation. For instance, if a population with mental illness, either it can be depression, anxiety, uh, or even people recovering from surgery, children, elderly people. So it depends. So when we design a forest bathing intervention, f like for instance, a eight week program or a two day workshop for stress management. So whenever we design a forest bathing for a specific population and purpose, we would call it forest therapy. This is the definition that we are using at the forest therapy institute because other institutions would use both terms in the same way and we felt the need of making it more professional that's what we are using uh, at the moment to really explain the difference between forest therapy and forest bathing we could do it uh, in a eight hour workshop or a several week uh, program and then we would consider it forest therapy of course basically in uh, the forest therapy institute's approach and methods to forest therapy and forest bathing one of our core principles is to work on nature connectedness. And by nature connectedness is the definition which is the extent to which individuals include nature as part of their identity. Uh, and so many approaches would forget this part. And there's a, a beautiful research done by Derby University where they identify five main pathways where we humans develop our nature connectedness. So when we start including nature as part of our identity. Uh, so again, traditional approaches to nature connection would mostly focus on knowledge, on just f learning facts and curiosities of nature, which is amazing, of course, but wouldn't really work on this more emotional and deeper relation to, to nature. So what they identified the five main pathways that we humans really develop this nature connectedness is of course first the senses, second beauty, how do we perceive beauty in nature, the third emotion, how we develop positive emotional states when we are in nature, and then fourth meaning, how in nature is so it's so natural for humans to really express metaphor and, and, uh, and meaning of, of things that we are going through in our lives. And five is really the compassion pathway. So how we develop this reciprocity with nature that we give or, or that we receive well, well-being and health, but we also give back to nature. So by developing this nature connectedness is really one of the core things that people start seeing in nature things that uh, naturally build up resilience. So a, f a forest therapy intervention to build resilience would always start by, of course, the sensory awareness. So people m first need to, to awaken this way of being in nature just by their senses and sensory exploration and really feeling their bodies and their necessities. Through this, we really start 
just awakening the other pathways, especially in, in resilience, I believe it's so important to develop the, the emotion, the meaning and the compassion pathways. So some, some activities and exercises that we could implement in the forest therapy activities would be start noticing all the different changes in nature, how nature always uh, uh, recovers from a stress, how when uh, after winter, spring always comes. So there could be many metaphors. And somehow people realizing this, they can see their, themselves mirrored in nature. This is one of the most powerful things, which is, is really the forest and nature in general as a mirror of our own lives and inner landscape, which is really, really beautiful. The guide uh, really designed some exercises that really focus on that. And some, sometimes some things just start building up by themselves. In forest bathing, in our approach to forest bathing and forest therapy, we always say that the, the guide or the practitioner is not the therapist. We are practitioners or guides. So we sometimes say that the forest is the therapist. So people, we, we give a, what we call this invitations. Instead of using the word exercise or activity, we call this invitations. So they're mostly these suggestions for people to explore their own connection to nature and to the forest. They're never prescriptive. They're these suggestive ways of, of really approaching the forest. So let, let me think of a, a great example. Um, something so simple as practicing gratitude for what you have in, in your life or for what you are seeing there. We could just invite people for uh, wonder in the forest uh, really just look for, for things around them and just express gratitude in their own way. And by these, people are just really exploring their own ways of doing that. And then we can gather around in a circle. We use a lot of the council approach. And each individual, each participant will bring something, some way of, of, of thanking uh, the forest for the experience or for something in their lives. And again, this really enriches a lot the experience as um, really people see in all their participants some things that they wouldn't have realized, but at the same time they are exploring their own way of being grateful for something so simple and then they can really take that home to really start seeing more positive changes in their lives. But again, so we, we can model that we promote that, we create the space, and we, do, we give the participants the invitation, but then they have the, the freedom and the space to explore that in their own way. Nature Deficit Disorder has been mostly developed for working with the children, and then we would see children lacking a lot of cognitive skills when they lack this time in nature, really struggling to concentrate for longer periods of time, again, not building resilience, and. What we see, the evidence, and just also by the practice, is that both children and, and adults in the forest, it's, well, one of the, well, we could, this is a complex one, because there are so many factors, but uh, let me approach maybe the, the, the concentrating and, and, uh, and focus skills. What we see when, when we spend too much time in the office and looking at screens is that our, our focus uh, stops, like we get exhausted mentally. And the research shows, there's this really, really beautiful research done on attention uh, restoration theory, is that by looking at natural patterns in nature, it could be the waves or the, the patterns in water, the way trees grow, the clouds, whatever it is, our brains don't spend energy looking at these patterns. So it's, it becomes a restorative experience for, the, for our mental energy. Uh, so by going to the forest and really inviting people to spend some time just looking at patterns or looking at in the water, after this they have a very quick response to mental fatigue and they, f they leave the forest very recovered, full of energy. We have beautiful feedback from, from, uh, from participants with this. When we have so much time, so disconnected to nature, we can never experience this. And when we are tired, we go on holidays, but we still keep looking at screens and we have never, we, we never truly recover from mental fatigue.
So by really developing nature connectedness to people, they, they have also they, they build a good, uh, an amazing skill uh, that can cope and, and really compensate for this nature deficit disorder. This is only one of the ways it works. We have an innate need for nature, like the term biophilia. We as humans have this innate love for nature and, and living beings. Uh, and sometimes this is not, again, or uh, this is not developed in people. They have, they, we all have this potential, but sometimes it's just sleeping there. So what we see is sometimes just by bringing people to a natural environment and just being there and being present and mindful, they start just being more aware that they have this innate love and, and we, they, they do feel this general well-being with themselves and with the environment. And I, I do believe that this brings again something that so many authors and philanthropists say is that we all have inside of us our innate capacity to just feel happy. Of course, we've seen this a lot with the rise of uh, meditation and mindfulness practices, but sometimes the forest really enhances this a lot. Like when you are just in the forest, awakening your senses, because it's just not being there. Of course, we help people just shifting into a different uh, state of consciousness, really embodying more all the feelings they have and the sensations the forest giving, sometimes they shift into a different state of consciousness and we, they just start feeling naturally happy. And you just realize that I feel at home in the forest. And so sometimes this, this uh, also this consciousness of I am nature and nature is me, it just comes very natural. It's a consequence of you spending time immersed in nature. So instead of me preaching about we are the same or you are, you are nature, so I don't have to preach that as a forest therapy practitioner. I just take people in different experiencing the forest, in different sensory experiences. Sometimes I can give them these more uh, meaning, metaphoric invitations or just by spending time looking at trees, looking at other beings, always with some prompts, of course. Then slowly they just start feeling this, and this comes very natural, this experience sometimes of awe, of we are so little in the middle of all of this, but we are all connected. I think this is, this is very important for all this answer of feeling isolated. I also, I also I think it's important for people to understand that this can happen suddenly when, when you go to the forest, but... It's not a quick answer, so it's not like a pill, like you don't go to the forest, you take a pill and it's, it just happens. So it's something like a muscle that you need to develop and practice, so we call it the practice of forest bathing, uh, where you consistently start doing it as part of your daily life, and that's why we call nature connectedness as nature being part of your identity then it starts really changing you, or, or maybe not changing you, I, I think it really makes emerge the natural you, the natural self, all the best parts of you. And, and all of these connections to nature, to other beings start emerging. I have a, a very recent story from a group I guided uh, in a forest near Lisbon. And I think it was a very simple invitation in, at, 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 at its core, but uh, it really demonstrated the power of what you are saying, of really feeling connected to other people and to all the world around us. Because, again, one of the core things of people building resilience is that they are not separated, they are not isolated, we are all connected, both to nature, to the world, but we also need to build up good human relationships in our community. So this was, this was a very simple invitation. So in forest bathing and forest therapy, a classic invitation or exercise, if you want to call it that way, that we do is uh, these kind of invitations for people to simply spend some time getting to know a tree or other being as if it would be like a friend, you know? So, and it can be very, very simple as, uh, imagine you were getting to know a friend or someone for the first time. How would you get to know this tree? Because normally, and, and I come from, from a background of, of botany, so studying botany in a more scientific way. So even us that spend a lot of time in nature, we would like be analyzing or right like so this tree it's this species x and y and 
it has this kind of trunk, so analyzing, but not really in this more emotional way. So just by forgetting all the analytical stuff and just, just get to know the tree as if it was a friend. So I did this invitation for a group of six people. Uh, and again, we, we always use this very open language. We, we try not to be closed or prescriptive so they explore their own ways of, of really exploring their, their connection. It was so, it is always like we learn so much by just observing what participants are doing. So when you do you use this open relationship of just getting to know a tree of, as if it was a friend, some people would just like sit in front of a very small tree. It was a, a small tree we have here in our Portuguese forest that grows underneath the, the very tall pine trees. And this this uh, this participant would just sit there and he he would never say that this was a person that would be so calm to just sit and stare there. But he did that. Others were like so curious. They they looked like, like children. And these were adults, you know, but they were looked like children looking around, touching it. Some would like lean against the, the, the tree, like, or if you would like hugging a friend. And you really wonder, even your family and the people you love the most, if you think of what makes you love someone, it's not the facts or the things you know about the person, but it's really maybe the sensations that you have, the smell, the touch, how you feel, the emotional, the emotion that you, that you, that you feel for that person. So somehow in this very uh, easy exercise, they would just explore this in a very easy way. And imagine if you would do this consistently over several weeks. So again, when they come back, we do these circles and I just invited them to share as if they were that particular tree. So they have to, to, to speak in, their, in the first person. And I think they get so surprised in the things that they say. So I am this very small tree here underneath the tall pines and I'm almost hiding from the light, but I'm just here and I'm safe and everything is fine. <laughs> or others would say like, I'm a big pine and I've, lo and I've lost all my branches, but I'm still high and, and I'm fine. So it's so funny the way people start speaking about nature even us in the circle, we start listening to each other and we realize that we could have been, we could be talking about other people. And you start seeing yourself mirrored in the way we talk about other living beings, like a tree that you just met. So the way this starts making them realize about, again, compassion, accepting all your failures or, or wounds, like the, these trees won't, but it's so unique. And it's fine, just like me. And you can feel in people's faces the way they are starting to listen to each other, telling about each other's trees that they met. It, it becomes such a beautiful, compassionate exercise. And at, at its core, it's so simple. And it's so beautiful. We could be uh, talking here all day long about all examples of how nature is really, is really exploring this. And I, and I think... Resilience in nature, when, when you are used to study this or being in nature, it becomes very, again, obvious of so many examples that we have. But because people are so separated to nature, if we just stick people of learning facts, so imagine you would just watch to this nature uh, documentary, which would be, again, amazing. And I think they are, they are fundamental and important in terms of environmental education. But that's it. You get all these facts, that's okay. When you start bringing people into this more sensory, uh, metaphoric, compassionate approaches to nature, they do start to develop this deeper emotional bond. And in this way, then all these messages and, and lessons of resilience uh, in nature becomes easier not only to learn, but to really integrate in their in their life's experiences so some people have are more of course are are quicker to to have these deeper experiences uh, if we want to call it that way but others um i i wouldn't say not at all it it's but it but it does it is practice well, a good example that we can that we can see it's, in, it's still in the beginning of the walk so we all we, we always have this uh structure or, or framework or framework to to the walks and there is a part we always call the slowing down part which is really based on our mirroring senses so 
there is some, some research uh, showing that possibly we have these specific neurons in our brain which are responsible for this mirroring what we see in, in our environment. So we, we have this kind of invitations that normally we would invite people to just walk slowly in silence and notice what is moving in the forest. And this is uh, probably one of the most challenging invitations, especially if people are very used to uh, walk really fast or be always very rushed in their thoughts. And some people get even more anxious and they, th and they think, why am I being more anxious? Or why am I coming to this forest bathing uh, experience to relax and I'm feeling more anxious? And the amazing thing is that when this happens, after the second or most of the times the second or, or the third time they go, then they surprise themselves that, wow, I can do this now. So I used to hate this part. This part would make me anxious and I would just feel so rushed and now I can slow down I can stop and I can just really notice what's moving and I think if we have experience uh, of, of, of or just friends and professionals who are always very stressed and anxious and and it's so hard for them just to stop and maybe learn to meditate or do some mindfulness or yoga it's amazing the results we have of just in this guided approach to being in nature, yes, we have these really amazing results. And, 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 and it's so powerful when people start bringing a little bit of these uh, experiences to their daily lives. So you need to save some time of your day to really practice this. Uh, of course, forest bathing in its origin was really developed to give ecotourism in Japan a uh, service for people to spend a weekend maybe in a, in a place near the forest. But, but I'm a huge believer that part of this, we also need to give people the tools to, to really practice uh, this every day. So it's, it's, it's again not, not giving the fish, but teaching people how to fish, right? So um, just by, of course, I, it's, it's amazing to go to a guided forest bathing walk or forest therapy workshop. Uh, or, or other activities uh, during a weekend or an amazing uh, uh, retreat. But from all those exercises that you, that you try, I, I'm a huge believer that we also need to train people. So choose from all these tools what you can implement in your, in your life, whether it's uh, if you start waking up early and you just have all the first minutes of your day just looking at the sky, listening to the birds, and then you can do a yoga or meditating or go for a run and just then stop. I'm a fan of, of uh, sunsets, of when your day is, is finishing, just finish your work and don't go to your phone or to your t or television. Just go outside and look at the sunset. It can be such a powerful experience. And, and we can see this in, in people uh, like athletes, great speakers, people who are performing in a high level and, and they are very stressful environments, but after so many years, they keep performing. And we know this, that this works because they know how to recover. So uh, Cristiano Ronaldo, our football player, is a great example. Cristiano knows how to recover. So you need whatever tools you research, and I think your project is so beautiful in this, that whether it is nature-based approaches, art approaches, going for a massage, doing sports, whatever it is, people really need to equip themselves with the tools that are the right uh, for, for them. And I think uh, each one of us will have their uh, individual journey, right, of finding which tools work for us to really have these tools for recover. And with, rec with a practice of recovering, of restoring our mental and, and physical energy, we build resilience. So, so Japan, uh, alongside with Finland, uh, are some of the is or is one of the the countries in the world with the biggest forest coverage. So they have forest everywhere, and and because of of their uh, native religion Shintoism, even after Buddhism and uh, Christianity entered the Japanese culture, they never erased the native. Re religion as we have here in Europe. So our original, what we call pagan practices, were also very founded in nature. But in Japan, it it uh, survived. 
So we see, and, and the curious part is that if, even in Japan, most Japanese people are not religious people. But it's so uh, rooted in their culture that everyone practices somehow this uh, Shintoistic practices or beliefs. And, in, and what Shintoism does is that you see spirits and divine entities in all nature, in the stones, in the water, in trees, which is beautiful. And, and if we watch some beautiful Japanese animation, we will see this very well represented. So that's somehow why the forests have this powerful meaning to Japanese. And again, in the origin of uh, forest bathing and forest therapy, or Shinryoku in Japan, the Japanese government observed that populations were people had more access to forests, had less cases of cancer or less cases of many stress-related diseases uh, that were really rising to a problematic level in the 1980s where Japan was having a huge economic growth. So what we still see today is people spending too much time in the city, not being in nature, people start getting, getting sick, getting ill. And, and we see a lot of this with the rise of, of mental illness, but also a higher risk of diseases like heart disease, cancer. So they observe that, okay, so we have these cities where people have access to forests and they have less cases of this. Why is this? So that's the origin why the Japanese government funded so many studies to understand what was happening in the forest that was really lowering our stress levels and boosting our immunity. And then, of course, this was the origin of really, okay, so let's grab all this research and structure a practice, structure uh, a name and a practice, a method of using this research to really help people uh, improving their health. So so this was the, the history of the original of Shumiyoko and that answering why the forest. But of course, so we have the name of forest therapy as the translation of the of the Japanese original word. But as you were saying, there are some benefits uh, specific to forest environments, especially with the phytoncides, which is these aromatic chemicals that uh, trees emit in the atmosphere, which we know f by the Japanese research that are really boosting our immune response to to cancer and to viruses. So these are one of the magical, I would say, not, not magical, but really most powerful things that the forest can give us. But the other parts of the psychological benefits and psychological and emotional benefits of being in nature, they can be in a garden, in the ocean, uh, in the countryside, so anywhere that we consider these uh, green spaces or natural spaces.